In this lecture, we're going to talk about the biological applications of coordination chemistry. There are so many examples, so we're just going to discuss a few of them. First, I wanted to mention that the period four transition metals, or specifically the first row of your transition metals, such as chromium, copper, iron, cobalt, all of these metals are essential to organisms with the exception of scandium and titanium. And some organisms, such as plants, also require molybdenum. One example is this enzyme. This is nitrogenase, which catalyzes the reduction of nitrogen to ammonia. This particular enzyme contains molybdenum. So in this lecture, we're going to talk about the biological applications of coordination chemistry with just three examples. The first is hemoglobin. Then we'll talk about cisplatin. And finally, gadolinium contrast agents. So hemoglobin is an, an incredibly important protein because it is what transfers oxygen in most vertebrates. So hemoglobin makes up 35% of our blood cells, or if you take out the water, 96% of our red blood cells. Each one of our hemoglobin proteins can bind four molecules of oxygen. And if you'll notice, this is a tetrameric protein, and there are four heme groups in each hemoglobin protein. Let's zoom in on what this heme group looks like, and it looks probably pretty familiar. So if you look, this is an octahedral coordination site. Iron 2 is our Lewis acid, and our heme, our histidine, and our oxygen are our Lewis bases, or, our, or the ligands in this coordination complex. So your heme group serves as the active site of oxygen transport from your lungs to your tissue. There's a coordination number of six. We've got a bond to this histidine. We've got three co coordinate covalent bonds to the nitrogens in our heme groups. And we also, ox when oxygen binds, we have a bond to oxygen. Hemoglobin is transporting it's picking up the oxygen in the lungs and then releasing the oxygen in the tissue. And so once in the tissue, the oxygen is used to oxidize glucose, and this oxidation is the source of energy for cellular meta metabolic processes. One thing we need to talk about is geometry. The deoxygenated heme group, coordination number of five, pseudo square pyramidal geometry. So we've got our iron, This pseudo square pyramidal geometry. Um, so, coordination number is five, and this is not quite planar, these nitrogens from our heme group. So, I'll just kind of connect those because those are pl this plane. And then over here, we have a coordination number of six and an octahedral geometry. And another important piece is that. The deoxygenated hemoglobin is iron two, and when it's oxygenated, our oxygen oxidizes iron from iron two to iron three. Okay, so let's talk about the crystal field theory of each of these. So if we were to draw out the crystal field splitting diagram, let's first think about what the decount is. So iron two, iron is in the eighth group of the periodic table, so eight minus two is D6. And over here we have iron three, and iron three has a D5 electron configuration. So the splitting diagram for each of these is gonna look a little bit different. So with our pseudo square pyramidal, um, your DZ, DX squared minus Y squared is gonna be your highest in energy. But remember that this is not quite planar, so it's not gonna have quite as much overlap as it would in a square planar or in a true square pyramidal. So your DZ squared is probably gonna be, you know, relatively close in energy below the DX squared minus Y squared. And then your other three, your DXY, DXZ, DYZ. Okay, so if I were filling these up, I would guess it would look something like this. It could also be an electron configuration like that. Just a possible guess. But 
you're probably going to get an excitation if wavelength hits, say, your dxy. It's specifically this energy separation. We know that deoxygenated blood is a purplish color. So there's probably a couple different transitions taking place. You could maybe have this transition and maybe also this higher energy transition, but we're probably absorbing some yellow light. So this might have a lambda max around 570 nanometers roughly, so absorbing yellow and appearing purple. But again, there's probably multiple transitions taking place here. For iron three, we now have this octahedral geometry and iron's been oxidized from iron two to iron three. So I would guess that this would be a low spin electron configuration. And we know that, that oxygenated hemoglobin is bright red. So that means it's most likely absorbing in the green region. So our lambda max, you know, might be somewhere around 490 nanometers. So we're absorbing a shorter wavelength for this excitation to occur because delta octahedral is bigger than our energy separation for our deoxygenated hemoglobin. Let's talk about binding of oxygen and hemoglobin. So there's a couple important pieces here. The first is that we have what's called cooperative binding. So remember here, we talked about this geometry change when we went from the deoxygenated to the oxygenated hemoglobin. Once, once that small geometry change takes place, that small change in geometry triggers changes in geometry in the other binding sites, which makes it easier for the oxygen to bind. So once one oxygen binds, the other, the other sites bind with oxygen very easily. This is called an allosteric effect. And we can also think about Le Chatelier's principle because when hemoglobin is in the lungs, there's an excess of oxygen. So that's gonna drive the equilibrium towards the bound hemoglobin. But then when the hemoglobin reaches the tissues and the environment is oxygen deficient, the equilibrium is gonna shift back towards the free hemoglobin and release the oxygen. Let's also talk about ligands that compete with oxygen. So there's a few different ligands that compete with oxygen and hemoglobin, but we're gonna focus specifically on carbon monoxide. So carbon monoxide binds with iron much stronger than oxygen. And this is because of this concept of pi backbonding. So oxygen has a double bond, so it can participate in backbonding a little bit, but carbon monoxide, remember carbon monoxide has this triple bond, two pi bonds, so you can participate in pi backbonding twice. Um, so this strengthens the metal ligand bond because carbon monoxide binds so tightly to the iron, this results in your hemoglobin being unable to transfer oxygen. And what's kind of terrifying is air containing as little as 1% carbon monoxide will convert hemoglobin to carboxyhemoglobin in just a few hours, which can lead to loss of consciousness and death. You might also be wondering about the cyanoligand because we also talked about how the cyanoligand, cy the cyanoligand is isoelectronic with carbon monoxide. Um, it also participates in pi back bonding, but um, cyan cyanide poisoning, if you've heard of cyanide poisoning before, actually interferes with the cytochrome in the electron transport chain rather than hemoglobin. Um, one other thing to mention is smoking. So, you know, we all know that smoking is not the best thing for our health, um, but one of the reasons why smoking is bad is because there's a 400 ppm concentration of carbon monoxide in cigarette smoke that ties up about 6% of your hemoglobin. And this, this causes increased stress um, on your heart because your heart has to work harder to compensate for that oxygen deficit. There's a lot of risks for smoking, but um, the carbon monoxide is just one of those risks. I wanted to also mention hemocyanin so this is a hermit crab and hermit crabs are pretty cool because they have this blue blood. Hermit crabs and other invertebrates such as 
spiders, they use a different mechanism to transport, transport oxygen, specifically called uh, hemocyanin. This is oxyhemocyanin, so this is what it looks like once the oxygen binds. And this is pretty cool. Remember, we talked really briefly about bridging ligands, so your oxygen is actually acting as a bridging ligand between two copper centers in hemocyanin. So two copper ions reversibly bind one oxygen molecule. So oxygen acts as a bridging ligand across those two copper. And it's clear when deoxygenated and blue when oxygenated. Hermit crabs, spiders, scorpions, there's many examples of species that have this blue colored blood. Okay, this is just a nice infographic from Compound Chem that shows different blood and in different uh, species. So most vertebrates have hemoglobin, which we talked about. Spiders, crustaceans, mollusks have this hemocyanin that we mentioned. Um, and then worms, leeches, and some marine worms have this chlorochrorin. And marine worms, such as the peanut worms, have this hemorthyrin. So, and this is a violet color. Not all blood is red. So that's a pretty interesting, interesting piece about oxygen transport in different organisms. Okay, so let's segue to cisplatin. Cisplatin is an anti-cancer drug, and it's primarily used for testicular cancer. For example, Lance Armstrong, he's a famous cyclist. He uh, took cisplatin to beat testicular cancer. So this is also a coordination compound. We've actually seen this coordination compound before when we were talking about geometric isomers. So it's specifically the cis isomer, the trans isomer of this coordination compound it does not have the same medicinal properties. Platinum 2, it's D8 square planar, and it's an anti-cancer drug. And the way that it works is it binds to DNA, causing a kink in DNA, which induces apoptosis. Okay, so this is DNA, and DNA strands um, are known as polynucleotides, and there's, they're made up of these monomeric nucleotides, which contain one of the four nucleobases. So we have guanine, adenine, cytosine, and thymine. So let's talk about the mechanism of how cisplatin binds to DNA. Okay, so it's specifically guanine and also adenine that bind to your cisplatin, and it's specifically through this N7 nitrogen. Adenine nucleobase has a very similar structure to guanine, with the exception of this amine group over here. They both bind, so this nitrogen essentially donates to the platinum to form a coordinate covalent bond. So your cisplatin can bind to these two nitrogens from two different guanine units or from a guanine and an adenine nucleobase. And what that causes are these crosslinks. So we have these crosslinks either interstrand, like across two different strands, or intrastrand in the same strand. So we can get lots of different places where the cisplatin can bind to the DNA. And when this happens is it creates a kink. Okay, so it binds to DNA in the N7 position of the guanine, primarily to adjacent 1-2 intrastrand adducts, and this creates a kink in the DNA, which allow, which causes the DNA, it, the DNA can no longer um, have its typical function of trans transcription and translation, which ultimately leads to apoptosis or cell death. And so it's really important to note here that if you had a transplatinum molecule, it's the chloral ligands that are easily displaced. So these would be the two binding sites. So you can see if the platinum bound to this guanine here, it couldn't easily bind to another guanine if you had transplatin. So transplatin will not have the same uses. And there is a video that I want you to look at that's an animation of how cisplatin binds to the DNA. So please look at that, it's posted on Canvas. There's one minor difference between the video and some other explanations of how cisplatin's mechanism works, and this is the loss of chlorine atoms. So your cisplatin comes across the cell membrane through passive diffusion because it's neutral, but 
um, once it's cr once it crosses the cell membrane, it's likely that the cisplatin is hydrolyzed, so water molecules replace the chlorine or the chloral ligands. So there are some side effects to cisplatin. So yes, it binds to DNA, but then it can other it can also bind with other things such as your amino acids. So cysteine and methionine both contain these sulfurs, which have these lone pairs on them that can donate to platinum. Platinum's relatively soft. It's a bigger metal. Sulfur's a softer Lewis base. So these softer sulfur atoms can bind with the cisplatin and cause various side effects. And also it can kill a lot of healthy cells as well. So there's a lot of side effects with a drug like cisplatin. Some other similar drugs to cisplatin have been produced. Here's three analogous different. So here's our original cisplatin, but carboplatin has also been produced and oxaliplatin. So the difference with these two, you'll notice we have chelating agents. We have these bidentate ligands here. On, in both of these cases, here we have an oxalato ligand. Over here, we have this other um, bidentate ligand. So because we have bidentate ligands rather than these monodentate ligands, these complexes are more stable. And they're, or another way of saying that is that they're less reactive because of the chelate effect. So that leads to fewer side effects. So they end up reacting with fewer things. Okay, the last example is gadolinium contrast agents specifically for MRI. MRI is magnetic resonance imaging. And with MRI, we are looking at, we're using magnets to look at protons in water molecules, the spin of protons in water molecules. So the purpose of your gadolinium is it shortens the relaxation time of protons in neighboring water molecules. There's some downsides. Gadolinium is toxic. Um, and so what's really important with these gadolinium contrast agents, you'll notice that all of them are chelated. Every single one of these have multidentate ligands with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, denticity of eight often. Um, so chelating is crucial for gadolinium contrast agents because gadolinium is toxic. It can stand in for other metal ions such as calcium in your body, which can cause problems. So let's talk about what MRI is. So NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance or MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, it's the same type of spectroscopy. We're specifically looking at the nuclear spin of protons, so protons specifically. So you can think about a proton, you can think about a spinning proton as rotating spherical charge. So anytime you have moving charge, that's gonna create a magnetic field. Or we could call this a magnetic moment. Each one of our protons has a magnetic moment, just like an electron has a magnetic moment. What we do is we take a really big magnet, an external magnet. It doesn't look like this. It's actually an electromagnet. So this is what it looks like over here. So we have an electromagnet and what it does is it aligns all of our hydrogens in a particular direction. And then we apply radio waves or a pulse. So we ap apply this second energy that causes our spins to flip. And then, so we get spins flipping. And then what we are measuring, the amount of time it takes for the spins to what we call relax or realign with the magnetic field. So this is what we call a relaxation time. And then this relaxation time, your relaxation time is specific to your the environment of that spin. So we can get information about the environment of the spin based on these different relaxation times and construct an image. So let's talk about how gadolinium can help us. 
So gadolinium is a lanthanide element 64. Gadolinium zero has an electron configuration of xenon 4F7, 5D1, 6S2. We start getting really weird um, electron configurations once we get to these bigger metals that don't exactly follow the alpha principle because these energy levels are all so close in energy. So gadolinium three plus has an electron configuration of 4F7. Remember that your 4F sublevel so a 4F sublevel has principal quantum number of four, angular momentum quantum number of three. So we have three angular nodes. So our orientation M sub L quantum number can be negative three. I'll just write them here. Negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, plus one, plus two, or plus three. So we have seven orbitals in our 4F sublevel. So we end up with seven unpaired electrons. So this is important because if we have a mag large magnetic moment, this is going to speed up the relaxation of neighboring protons. So when we are designing a gadolinium contrast agent, we want to think about a few things. We were using gadolinium three because it has seven unpaired electrons, super large magnetic moment. We also wanted to have high aqueous solubility because they're admin administered intravenously. So they need to be soluble in water and they need to have some type of open coordination site for a water molecule to bind like this. So it's specifically the lone pair on the water binding to our gadolinium. And the last is that it has high relaxivity, which means that the gadolinium shortens the proton relaxation time by a lot. And this is what allows us to have contrast. So we're speeding up the relaxation of these protons. And so in the areas where we have the gadolinium contrast agent, we have faster relaxation times for our protons. We also need to think about exchange rates. So the, the ligands must allow for fast water exchange rates so that the gadolinium can exchange with a lot of water molecules and speed up the relaxation time of many water molecules. And this is really important. We mentioned earlier that gadolinium is, is toxic. So it needs to be stable to substitution because it can substitute in for zinc two plus and other metals so we talked about a few different examples of biological applications of coordination compounds. And so there's so many examples of coordination compounds in uh, biochemistry. And these are just a small sampling.